Everybody knows the ancient civilizations and a great deal about their society, but when did the ancient world become the medieval world? This may sound a bit of a dumb question because there would of course have been a gradual process in the different societies involved. However, there are some questions we can try to answer. Who was the last person to write in hieroglyphics? When were the last slave auctions? When did people finally give up worshipping gods like Zeus? Now, of course, some of these may be near impossible to answer. For instance, there could have been later examples that have been lost to history. So, these are by no means categorical, but they're merely here to open up a bit of a conversation, especially as I have been unable to find many of the answers myself and would love a bit of help in finding them out. But first, as we are talking about fallen civilizations, then I must tell you about a real-time strategy game which focuses on a number of civilizations, like the Romans, Vikings, and many more. This is Rise of Kingdom. Now you can pick from a number of civilizations like Germany, Spain, China, Japan, the Ottomans, and many more. And you will have already noticed, you can actually see civilizations fight one another from a different era while creating a huge empire and deploying your own unique soldiers into the battlefield. On the path to building a huge empire and dominating the globe, you can upgrade your buildings, develop commanders for battles, and research technology to give you an edge against your opponents. So you could theoretically lead the Byzantines to victory against the British, or the Koreans against the Ottomans. And now there is a competition of civilizations. In fact, it is in the final round. And the competitors are Rome and the Vikings. So you can download the game for free at the link below. And for me, I'm always partial to the Vikings, so I'm going to vote for them. But this decision can be yours. Download the game and vote for your favorite, and I'll see you out there on the battlefield. Plus, as a further incentive, you'll also get a chance to win an iPhone 13, AirPods Pro, and a great deal more. So check out the link in the description. Okay, so for this one I'm going to discount the modern revivals, and I'll just look at those who never stopped worshipping the gods. Thankfully there seems to be a pretty simple answer to this one. They were in the Mani Peninsula, cut off from the rest of Greece in their mountains. Yet the answer may be a little surprising, as they were still worshipping the old gods in the 800s, the age of the Vikings. In the 10th century, a Byzantine document on the governance of the empire recorded, be it known that the inhabitants of Castle Mena, who up to the present time are termed Hellenes by the local inhabitants, on account of their being in olden times idolaters and worshipping of idols like the ancient Greeks, and who were baptised and became Christian in the reign of the glorious Basil. Basil here refers to Basil I, who ruled from 867 to 86, and they were called Hellenes because they followed the Hellenic religion. So there were still people who were worshipping the Greek gods at the time of the Viking Age, and also the rise of Islam. The Egyptians began to use demotics to write around 600 BC, but hieroglyphics survived. Unfortunately for the Egyptians, however, they spent centuries under foreign rule, like under the Assyrians, the Persians, Alexander the Great, through to Caesar, and onto the Byzantines and even Arab invaders. This meant that the Egyptian culture very much began to merge with that of their invaders. A good example of this is how the Greek alphabet and demotics would go on to form the Coptic alphabet in later centuries. But to really get a sense of how much the cultures began to merge, you should look at the 3rd century catacombs of Qom el Shakofa. This is decorated with artwork showing the Greek myth of the abduction of Persephone alongside Anubis. Plus Anubis can also be seen wearing Roman military uniform, while there are statues elsewhere of him wearing a Greek toga. Plus here there's also the bones of Emperor Caracalla's horse, showing that the Roman imperial cult was also prevalent alongside Greek and Egyptian myths. So because of this mixing of cultures, there have been some very late mummies found in Fayum. These were made for the Greeks who lived inside Rome and Egypt, and they have their portraits over the top. This seems to be a mix of Roman death masks and paintings, with Egyptian mummification for an ethnically Greek people. Most of these have been dated to around 1 century AD, but the practice may have continued until the 3rd century. As for the last ruler of Egypt to be mummified, well, the tomb of Cleopatra has yet to be discovered, and I couldn't find a definitive answer for the most recent Egyptian mummification. However, it seems that under Greek and Roman rule, the skill of mummification was beginning to be lost, and maybe they just failed to properly preserve the bodies. Yet, of course, mummification continued elsewhere for a lot longer. Some Buddhists tried to mummify themselves, primarily in Japan, but in the 1970s, a Thai man named Luang Po Deng succeeded. 
and going back to Egypt in hieroglyphics, the most recent to ever be discovered are called the Graffito of Esmet Akom, which were carved into a temple to Isis in Philae in the 390s. They said, Before Mandulus, son of Horus, by the hand of Esmet Akom, son of Esmet, the second priest of Isis, for all time and eternity, word spoken by Mandulus, lord of Abaton, great god. So this is talking about Mandulus, a Nubian god, and it evidently shows that people were still worshipping these gods after Christianity had already become the state religion of Rome. Plus, demotic inscriptions can be found there, especially in the south 100 years later. This temple was actually only closed in the 500s when Justinian and his Byzantine Empire ruled Egypt, and it was then driven underground. Yet, Egypt would be invaded by the Muslims just a century after that, so potentially, there were followers of Horus living under Islamic rule for a little while. And this brings me to my next question, as there may have been another strange group in Egypt around that time. Everybody knows the Roman legions, so there's no need to explain them, but you may well assume that they were abolished when Rome fell. However, the fall of Rome came about gradually, and in theory, as late as the 15th century, if you see the Byzantines as the true successor to the Roman Empire. But there were, of course, no legions defending the Byzantines against the Ottoman Empire. However, they could well have been defending the Byzantines against the first Islamic invasion of their empire, way back in the 7th century. But first, one annoying thing about researching this was the fact that most of the legions just seemed to have disappeared without a trace sometime after 400 AD. But fortunately, the Notitia Dignitarum records a lot of them, as well as their shields, sometime around 400. And one historian named Constantine Zuckerman writes that there have been inscriptions found in Egypt which were made in the 630s. I've not been able to find images of these inscriptions myself, so I'm sort of relying on his word and the many people who saw them. But there seems to be a couple of centuries of information missing, Yet, if they are true, this would mean they were in Egypt a couple years before the Arab invasions. So, maybe you had Muslim invaders fighting legionnaires, albeit very, very late Roman legionnaires. Chariots were the most devastating shock troop in many ancient armies. Although many people associate it with the Egyptians, it could, of course, be found around the world, like in Mesopotamia, China and Britain. But what's interesting about the spread of the chariot is that the Egyptians didn't have the chariot during their Old and Middle Kingdoms period. It was only introduced to the country when the Hyksos invaded from the north. Now these are believed to have been a Semitic people, dubbed the Shepherd Kings, and their initial success against the Egyptians was largely attributed to the chariots. Yet the horses that they used were pretty small, the average height of them being just around 1 meter 30, so what many people today would call a pony. Over time, selective breeding strengthened the horses, and as they grew, there was no longer any need to have two or four or six horses pull a couple men into battle. Around the time of the Roman Empire, men could finally ride a horse into battle themselves. Chariots, on the other hand, were obviously useless in the forests, mountains and the likes, but they were still deployed against the Romans. It seems that the last mention of chariots was at the Battle of Mons Grapius in Scotland in 84 AD, but these chariots were defeated with ease. After that battle, chariot racing was still popular in Rome in the Byzantine Empire, plus chariots were sometimes used as transport even in Anglo-Saxon England. But they largely became the transport for the gods and not men, as Nordic mythology shows some gods riding them, but I can't find any evidence of the Vikings actually using them themselves, despite being featured on the show Vikings. So Hannibal famously crossed the Alps on them, and the Seleucids and Ptolemaic Egyptians used them in battle. In fact, as a side note, during the Battle of Raphia in 217 BC, the Seleucids fought on 102 Indian elephants, while the Egyptians had 79 African ones. But anyway, elephants continued to be used by the Mughals in India, and were a constant feature in warfare in Southeast Asia. The Siamese even had a minister of elephants in the 17th century, and they were used well into the 19th century. The Burmese, for instance, used them in battle against the British in the 1820s at the Battle of Danubiu but these elephants fled at the sights and sounds of the Concrete rockets. The Siamese used them in their war with the French in the 1890s, but during this war, they didn't exactly charge the enemy, but were used as mounted infantry and even artillery. After that, they were used as pack animals in many wars, even during the World Wars, and allegedly in Vietnam. But just one interesting story. During the US Civil War, the King of Siam offered the Americans elephants, 
but Abraham Lincoln refused, saying, Our political jurisdiction, however, does not reach a latitude so low as to favour the multiplication of the elephant. And steam on land as well as on water has been our best and most efficient agent of transportation in internal commerce. Slave raids and slave markets were just part of life for centuries, continuing well until the 19th century. Obviously, the Romans would take slaves, the Turks and Mongols raided the Slavs, the Europeans took slaves in Africa, the Muslims of North Africa raided as far north as Iceland, the list is endless. And obviously, all of these were brought back to huge slave markets. But one of the last major slave raids I could find was in Ethiopia in the 1910s, when the uncrowned emperor of Ethiopia, Ayasu, began to personally lead some of his own raids and enslaved many people that were considered to be black Africans compared to the ruling Amharic people. During his short rule, upwards of 40,000 people were enslaved during raids and Walaita people also reported the capture of their children in 1931. The slave continued for a while and even Mussolini used it as a pretext to invade the country. As for slave markets, well, there was a documentary made in the 1960s which shows slave markets in Saudi Arabia. And then there is Mauritania, which was the last country to abolish slavery in the 1980s. But it's still believed that upwards of 10% of the country are actually slaves. Even in South Sudan, the United Nations recorded a large trade of slaves in the 1980s and 90s. One report actually says that the price of a slave dropped from $90 to $15 from 1989 to 1990 on account of slave raids launched during the Sudanese wars. While up in Libya, there is footage of migrants being auctioned off within the last few years. So, although modern forms of slavery like sex slavery and the likes obviously exist, so do to slave raids and slave auctions. And that's where I'll leave it today. But do you have any other similar questions? Leave them in the comments below and I hope to get back to you with an answer.